Texans head to the polls this week for the primary election, the top races to watch, and what's on the line at the state capitol. Our political roundtable weighs in, Alana Rocha from the Texas Tribune and James Berrigan from the Dallas Morning News. Do you plan to pay these fines? Yes. Do you plan to file the reports? Yeah. Some of your leaders failing to pay the state for campaign violations. We investigate which lawmakers owe tens of thousands of dollars and why they're still allowed to run for office. A teacher with a pistol is no match for a deranged person with a military assault rifle. A major debate among lawmakers in the aftermath of a deadly school shooting. Our analysis of the state's school marshal program and why it's getting attention at the White House. We're excited about the, the hundreds of thousands of jobs that are created because of this industry and what it means to Texas. And from elected official to leading the state's oil and gas association, we sit down with former Texas Agriculture Commissioner Todd Staples. His outlook on oil production after Hurricane Harvey and how it could impact lawmakers' funding decisions in the next legislative session. It's all ahead on State of Texas. Good morning and thanks for joining us. I'm Josh Hinkle. This week, political eyes across the country are on Texas as we hold the first official primaries for the midterms. Today, we're breaking down the most hotly contested races you'll really want to understand before casting your vote. Up first, the Democrats fight for governor between two frontrunners, former Dallas County Sheriff Lupe Valdez and this businessman, Andrew White, who's also the son of former Governor Mark White. The winner will face Republican incumbent Governor Greg Abbott, who is looking like a shoe-in for re-election. Following a mass shooting at a Florida school, it's no surprise the conversation in this race has focused on gun control and how each candidate would tackle that issue here at home. You can support the Second Amendment and also support common sense gun safety legislation. If you restrict the ability to buy large capacity magazines, you effectively shut down the assault weapons. We have to look at the types of people that are being able to buy the weapons. We should be able to say to some folks, no, you cannot get that. The latest University of Texas, Texas Tribune poll shows Valdez ahead with 43% of likely primary voters. White had 24%. That survey was conducted just days before the Florida shooting, which could sway some voters. If no one gets a majority among the wider field of candidates, the top two finishers will go to a runoff in May. One race to watch on the Republican side, Texas Land Commissioner. Incumbent George P. Bush has a credible challenge from his predecessor, Jerry Patterson. That same survey shows Patterson at 31 percent, far behind Bush, who sits at 57 percent among likely primary voters. But in these last few days, will it be enough for Bush to avoid a runoff, especially today when the GOP is the party of Trump and no longer the Bushes? And finally, a Republican battle to replace retiring Congressman Lamar Smith in his Central Texas district, stretching from San Antonio to the Austin suburbs. 18 candidates are in this field, so it's really too close to say much more than expect a runoff. A few of the names you might know, former Ted Cruz staffer Chip Roy, State Representative Jason Isaac, and former Bush administration official Jennifer Sarver, who actually voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016. For insight, we turn to our political roundtable, and joining us is Alana Rocha from the Texas Tribune and James Berrigan from the Dallas Morning News. Now, early voting isn't always a strong indicator of what might happen later in the year for uh, the general election, but it is a good indicator for voter enthusiasm at least, right? Yeah, I think it's no surprise that Democrats are turning out so highly. Uh, the president is obviously a sort of lightning rod for them and they're sort of identifying any Republican with the president. On the other hand, on the Republican side, I think there might be some hesitance um, from more moderate Republicans to come out in the primary kind of along those same lines because of the president and sort of the the far deeper right turn that the party is taking so i think that sort of maybe reflects the the turnout in the republican races yeah at a recent gop event senator ted cruz who's up for re-election he said that democrats would crawl over broken glass in november to vote and he uh, warned his republicans that uh, they would get obliterated if that was the case in the polls. Yeah, and of course, then the issue of gun control has come up and saying that the, the liberals and the Democrats just want to take your gun. So that's been another uh, element to this. But then, of course, the president came out this week saying, you know, let's take the guns and worry about the legalities of it later. So uh, lots of mixed signals. And Governor Abbott also is coming out and saying, you need to make sure you get out there and vote for us. So they're not right. taking anything for granted. No. If a 
runoff does happen between certain races, let's say land commissioner like Jerry Patterson and George mm -hmm. P. Bush. What does that mean? How does that play out? Well, it means that it gives, you know, let's say with Republicans uh, statewide in office, it gives the Democrat who maybe doesn't have a runoff to worry about more time to focus on the November election. If you have a runoff, then the energy has to go to that, that runoff and not be looking ahead to uh, the final decision. So uh, I think, you know, they have to spend more money. They have to be campaigning for another race before the big race. And so I think there can be drawbacks there. And the optics are not good. Uh, for Commissioner Bush specifically, he's got three other Republican challengers, including a very loud and vocal Jerry Patterson, former land commissioner. Um, and, and Patterson has sort of lowered the bar. He said after uh, the um, ethics filings or the financial filings came out um, that you know, C Commissioner Bush spent $2 million in the last filing period um, advertising, and Patterson said, you know, a guy who's spending $2 million, maybe he's scared he's going to lose, and losing means going into a runoff with Jerry Patterson. So he's sort of lowering the bar and setting that expectation that if there's a runoff, that's, that's a win for Patterson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, a lot of people with grassroots supports, their voters are going to come out for a runoff more so than whoever might be the front runner that at the primary time, right? Oh, right. That's all about turnout, just because it's a kind of an off-season date, if you will, uh, in the election cycle. And so I think you're going to get the most uh, loyal supporters out. All right. James, Alana, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. This week, we're also tracking the Republican race for Texas Agriculture Commissioner. Incumbent Sid Miller is out polling his closest challenger by twice as many likely voters, but many others are still undecided in this matchup. What does that say about Miller's track record? And if reelected, what will his next term demand? He needs to think about his, uh, uh, his own equation and his own math issues as he's dealt in that, in that office. We sit down with Miller's predecessor, Todd Staples, who landed another high-profile job when he left office, leading the state's largest oil and gas organization. And still ahead... It puts a stain on the honor of, um, of those of us who are simply trying to, to do the best we can for our constituents and for the state of Texas. State leaders reacting to our investigation, exposing an agency not always making candidates pay for campaign violations. You'll definitely want to see this report before you hit the polls this week. Join us to see who's failing to follow the rules, coming up on State of Texas. It's been almost six months since Hurricane Harvey formed off the Texas coast. Gaining strength to a Category 4, it knocked out oil and gas production in the Gulf of Mexico and inland. That created a fuel shortage, panicked drivers, and left long wait lines at the pumps. It was definitely cause for concern nationwide, considering Texas makes up more than a third of the nation's total oil refining capacity and more than a quarter of U.S. gas production. Now the job of assuring stakeholders things are bouncing back largely falls to this man, Todd Staples, the president of the Texas Oil and Gas Association, who, as many of you might remember, was once the Texas Agriculture Commissioner. Welcome. Good to be here today. I think the last time we talked to you about anything oil related was back during Hurricane Harvey and we were talking about price gouging and how there were, uh, you know, people that were really trying to take advantage of the gas prices. Have things really gotten better when it comes to that after Hurricane Harvey? Well, I think um, that uh, the Attorney General and we support strict prosecution of anyone that would take advantage of individuals in that situation. Uh, we still have uh, members of, of the oil and gas community who are still out of their home today and no one should be taken advantage of there. I, anytime you have uh, about 20 percent of our nation's fuel supply capacity that is taken offline, it creates a, a rippling effect throughout our nation. Uh, any, the entire Texas Gulf Coast was impacted so people were working day and night to supply the fuel that we needed and that's kind of where we are today is looking at ports and pipelines and refining and production and how all of that works together to do a lot of good things. Obviously provide the gasoline and the diesel that we need to, to run our school buses to get our kids to school every day, uh, but that really that produce the products that power our lives. In 2017, we just got the new numbers in, that uh, oil and gas paid $11 billion in state and local taxes and state royalties. That's $30 million a day that's going toward our first responders and our universities and building our roads. This time next year, state lawmakers will be back at the Capitol and they'll be talking about 
possibly tapping the rainy day fund, which we know uh, uses the oil and gas revenue to really replenish that fund. It's phenomenal the amount of production today. Our country surpassed the 10 million barrel a day mark. Uh, just a couple of months ago in, in, in production that hadn't occurred in almost 50 years. Texas produced 40% of that. If prices remain stable uh, and we have that continued production, there should be more revenue available to meet the needs that we have, more dollars that will be going into our state's rainy day fund. We recognize that ma that very well may need to be tapped into to meet the needs of Hurricane Harvey. We recognize that county roads uh, is an issue in these production areas. Uh, oil and gas pays into that rainy day fund. We think it makes sense to look for ways for the state to give them a little bit of those dollars back. We, we need to fund our schools and our universities. There's a lot of needs. Your successor, Sid Miller, he has a very different style of running that uh, agriculture department than you did. You know, he said he inher inherited a budget shortfall, and that's why he had to raise so many different fees. Uh, whether that was the case or not, it made a lot of people mad, farmers, even his uh, former colleagues in the House. He needs to think about his... Uh, uh, his own equation and his own math issues as he's dealt in that in that office. Uh, I think uh, there's a lot of information out there that reflects that the department has actually returned money to the state treasury year after year while I was there. Uh, it's a bunch of good people at the Texas Department of Agriculture. Agriculture is a strong part of our state's economy. And you really think about it, agriculture and energy are natural resources is one of the strengths that we have. Uh, I was talking to some folks from Lubbock today, the cotton capital of the world, and they're excited that uh, we have low cost natural gas today because natural gas it goes into making fertilizer that makes it more affordable to be competitive globally. So uh, the, the voters have a decision to make. I'll let them uh, make that decision. I think there's some good candidates out there. Will you ever step back into trying to get into public office? Well, my phone's been ringing a good bit. I, I'm really enjoying what I I'm doing today focused on job creation and growth and opportunities for Texans and uh, we'll see what happens. I'm, I'm really having a good time uh, going all over the state talking about Texas being the global energy leader, working uh, with delegations from around the world that come to Texas to find out what our secret is. And I, you know, I really try to emphasize to them that a stable business climate and a, and a stable regulatory climate is what will attract capital and investment. Uh, our industry actually supports well-funded, strong regulatory agencies like the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, like the Texas Railroad Commission, because we think there should be high standards for doing business in Texas. And we want um, science-based standards to occur. And uh, we're glad that in Texas we've got a good history of doing just that and solving problems and addressing things in the right way. Thank you for making time for us today. I appreciate it. Good to be with you. Thank you. Some of your elected leaders not paying what they owe for campaign violations. Do you plan to pay these fines? Yes. Do you plan to file the reports? Yeah. And a state agency that was not always holding them accountable until we stepped in. And you know what, we've done our best because you raised the issue. Before you cast your vote in this week's election, you'll want to see what we've discovered coming up. Voters across Texas will head to the polls on Tuesday for the primary election. And right now, politicians across the state are asking for your support. Before you make your decisions, you may be curious to know who's funding their campaigns. State law requires candidates tell you just that, but we've discovered some do not follow the rules and never file finance details. KXAN investigator Jody Barr found the state has not always held political candidates accountable for breaking the law, and it's something never even brought up until you started asking. That's right, Josh, and when they failed to file finance records, these men racked up ethics fines. The man owing the third most at $22,000, Chris Crystal, a former state Senate candidate from San Antonio. You'll meet him later. In second, Big Ben lawyer Anthony Foster Jr., who ran for a judgeship, he owes $30,000. But the man with the most outstanding debt, a sitting Texas House member, Representative Ron Reynolds, he currently owes $52,000. When you get a fine, you're supposed to face consequences if you don't pay. But we've discovered the agency in charge hasn't always been making people like these guys pay up. Yeah, Mr. Reynolds. 
Hey, I'm Jody Barn with KXAN. Yes. We've been trying to get a hold of you for several weeks. Our analysis of State Ethics Commission data shows Representative Ron Reynolds failed to file eight separate campaign reports since 2015. To find out why, we called, we emailed, but he never replied. Do you plan to pay these fines? Yes. Do you plan to file the reports? Yeah. They gave me 10 days to pay it or make arrangements. This is Chris Crystal, the man who's number three on our list of people who haven't paid up. Something he says came as quite a surprise since his campaign raised no money. Paul, and they said, yeah, you didn't do your personal financial statements. I said, okay. I said, well, I mean, I didn't raise a dollar, so what, what do I need to do? And she goes, oh, it's long past that. You got to go to court now. Crystal says he tried, but the commission would not waive his fines. He now owes nearly $22,000 for failing to file the required finance reports when he ran for Senate back in 2012. I mean, these dates are known. You do admit you, you missed them. You violated. Absolutely. And he's not alone. We found 264 candidates on the state's debtor list. Three current Texas House members, Representatives Donna Dukes, Nicole Collier, and Ron Reynolds. There are also five sitting district court judges and 80 attorneys. The Texas Ethics Commission will come to order. And the Texas Ethics Commission has two options when candidates fail to file financial forms, civil fines, and in extreme cases, a criminal charge. Specifically, the commission can refer debtors to prosecutors when they don't file this form. But in the past five years, that only happened 26 times. Ron Reynolds, not one of them. We asked the commission chair why. Could you tell us why this representative, for example, has not been referred to prosecution when it's clear by his record he has made a habit of not filing these reports? Yeah, I just don't know about this matter at all. I'm sorry. Any matters regarding complaints like this initially are confidential. If we say we believe in transparency, well, then this is, this is step one in, in, in all of that. File your reports. Representative Celia Israel sits on the House Elections Committee, which helps write campaign finance laws. One of her fellow committee members, Ron Reynolds. It is ironic. Um, it is unfortunate. It puts a stain on the honor of, um, of those of us who are simply trying to, to do the best we can for our constituents and for the state of Texas. What would you say to this representative if he was in here today about complying, paying the, his debt to society? Anybody who disregards the rules is letting themselves down, is letting their constituents down, and is letting the rest of us down who are trying to follow the rules. Despite his unpaid fines, Reynolds is running for office again, and so can anyone on this list. What you're unearthing may involve a bill um, so that we put more teeth or more structure to a, a situation, in which case um, the interim hearing is a good time to ask these kinds of questions. One angle might be, now you don't get to be on the ballot again until you until you clear this. You raised these questions, and because of that, we were happy to have it briefed today. And thank you so much for bringing it to our attention. It was very nice. It was the 17,000, and the second case was one. Meanwhile, Chris Crystal is slowly working to pay his debt to Texas. Oh, this, is, this is a 40-year payoff. If I, you know, I'm hoping I hit the lottery or something so I can pay these guys. They don't play, and I'm making payments. And if you want to see mine, I'll show you every little bit I got. I'm not lying. If I'm lying, I'm dying. As for the two men at the top of the list, they are not being prosecuted. Representative Reynolds, just two weeks after we caught him at that committee meeting, turned in his finance forms. Reynolds, though, is making payments on his debt, sort of. That's because the state is seizing his legislative paychecks. It doesn't look like Foster is paying back anything right now, and we have not been able to track him down to ask why. Our investigation did find the Ethics Commission referring some debtors to the Attorney General's office for collections. $1.2 million in the past five years, of which Josh, the AG has only collected about $300,000. What happened to all those cases that were prosecuted? Well, I can tell you only nine of them were ever charged, and seven of those had their charges dropped. Will more cases be prosecuted now? Well, just weeks after we brought this to the attention of the Ethics Commission, they instituted a criminal referral system. They tell me it is a permanent system, and this will continue to happen in the future. 
All right, we'll see what happens then. Thank you very much, Jody. If you want to see the 264 people on the state's debtors list before you head to the polls, we posted them all in this story in the investigative section of KXAN.com. They have to know. They walk in, they're going to probably end up dead. And if they know they're going to end up dead, they're not going into that school. President Donald Trump touting the Texas school marshal program after the recent violent attack on a Florida campus. Coming up, we take a closer look at the effectiveness of this controversial program and if more schools here at home will start arming teachers when State of Texas returns. The chief standards will tell you that. He'll tell us, please, you know, you're probably going to get there and you're going to be backing up the marshals because they've already taken care of the problem. A school district we've profiled has caught the attention of federal officials. Wiley ISD, just south of Abilene, has an undercover, trained school employee who can respond to a shooter with a gun. Now the superintendent there is making plans to speak with leaders in Washington about the program. Governor Greg Abbott says there are well over 100 school districts in Texas, like Wiley, that have teachers who are school marshals. Our Steffi Lee is here to explain how it all works. Yes, a school marshal is any school staff member who is licensed, certified, and anonymous. In other words, keeping their identity secret to make sure no one is targeted or tries to get the marshal's weapon. But here in Central Texas, we found several districts instead have school resource officers, actual police officers armed and on patrol on campuses with different officers Options to protect students. As IDEA makes its way through Washington, Texas members of Congress are weighing in about safety concerns with a school marshal on campus. We have to make sure that we have uh, that states and local school districts have the flexibility to put every measure of security in place they deem necessary. The only reason that there's so much focus on arming teachers is because we have elected officials here in Washington and at the state capitol who don't want to fulfill their own responsibility of doing something about the dangers of guns. The gun control debate is sure to continue as one of the defining points this election year. That's why you have to let the candidates know what you want from them. Cast your primary vote this Tuesday. You can find a list of polling places on KXAN.com and join me and the KXAN political team that night for live coverage on air and online. Thank you, Steffi, and thank you again for joining us for State of Texas. I'm Josh Hinkle. Have a great day.